Good evening out there, listening audience. This is Michael Cross here with another episode of Unlock the Door Radio, where our motto is question authority, just like one of our founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, said. And if you went to public school, just look up Benjamin Franklin in the uh, on the internet. You'll find he's actually quite interesting character. Anyway, uh, tonight we are very privileged to have uh, expert in many different fields. His name's Peter Van Buren. He has a long time record with the uh, State Department and has written extensively on the situation in Iraq. But I want to talk more about his other work, a fictional work that sounds a lot like um, the book The Grapes of Wrath, which was later made into a movie, one that I would really encourage people to watch nowadays. And well, I'm just going to turn things over to Peter. Uh, thanks. Peter, for coming on our show. It's my pleasure, Mike. The uh, book that I've recently written is called Ghosts of Tom Joad, a story of the 99%. And as you mentioned in the introduction, it draws heavily on John Steinbeck's uh, work, The Grapes of Wrath, and, and the wonderful film that uh, John Ford made uh, of that book. I hate to do this to you, but if any of the listeners have not read that book or have not seen that movie, they should probably just stop right here, um, put us on pause, and, and go do that, and then please, please come back. <laughs> um, the Grapes of Wrath was about the, the Depression. It was about the end of a way of life for Americans who were living in, in Oklahoma. They saw their land taken away by banks, uh, dust storms decimated their farms, and they had no choice but to pick up and move uh, westward in hopes of finding a new life and some work. Every step of the way, they, they found that society and the economic system that had evolved worked against them, and they, they suffered terribly at the hands of other Americans who were greedy and whose interests were, were simple uh, and, and predatory. Moving that story forward into 2014 was a, a sad but important journey for me. Following my time at the State Department, I had uh, written a book about Iraq called We Meant Well that upset the people at the State Department. Um, they labeled me a whistleblower, but not in a good way, and uh, forced me into early retirement. Along the way, I panicked. I became frightened. I thought I was going to lose the pension and benefits that I was counting on to, to get my family uh, through. And like the Jodes in Grapes of Wrath, I, I set out to find the only work uh, I could, which in my case, at age then 52, turned out to be minimum wage work in retail sales. For your listeners uh, outside the United States, the minimum wage throughout most of America right now is $7.25. And, and people can figure out how very little that is in, in their own local currencies and it ranks among the lowest minimum wages in the developed world. Once upon a time in America, that wage was designed really for high school kids working locally, college students uh, who were trying to earn a few dollars on, on the side to help their studies and, and things like that. It was never intended to be a living wage for the millions of Americans who now, because of the economic changes in our country, are forced to try to live on that little bit of money each month. What I saw in this new world order, if you will, shocked me and caused me, long after uh, the State Department and I had, had settled our differences and I had moved on into so-called retirement, uh, long after that, these people and their stories stuck with me I decided to start doing more academic research into the economy and at the same time traveling th and, and spending some time throughout the, the Midwestern part of the United States, our old industrial heartland, what's now called the Rust Belt. And I came to realize there was a story that, that had to be told, that most Americans outside of those areas didn't know. And that led me to write this book, The Ghosts of Tom Joad. You know... Your story, when I heard you on one of your interviews, it reminded me of a colleague I work with, and she was she's from Australia, but she was offered a position 
to work on a research project for a few months in the United States. And so she took that and she said that her impression of America from the media had been one that, well, things are pretty good. But when she got to the United States, she found that some of the people working on this, and again, these are people with, with good educations, that some of the people that she was working with were living in their vans. They were, or if they had an apartment, uh, they were working two jobs just to survive. And this shocked her. She was like, but these are people with educations. These are people who went to college, got their masters and PhDs, and they're working. They're working not just on a research project, but they probably are working another job and maybe two jobs just to pay the rent if they're lucky enough to have an apartment they can afford. As part of uh, when I was working uh, for minimum wage, um, we had a, a colleague, a co-worker um, who was fired for stealing food out of the break room refrigerator. He was uh, stealing the, the sandwiches and, and things that the rest of us brought to work to eat uh, uh, on our lunch break. And we found out soon after that he had been living in his car in the parking lot and was too ashamed to ask for help. Um, which we would have all we all would have given him our food if he had asked. He was too ashamed to ask for the help, and so he he st was stealing it out of out of the refrigerator to try to get by. When you're working for seven dollars an hour, that's part of of the sad story. But the other side of it is that most of these jobs will not offer you enough hours of work each week in order to make a living. Mm -hmm. Because of the way things are structured. Structured in the United States, if they offer you uh, more than 40 hours a week, they're almost always forced to pay benefits. Um, if they offer you more than 29 hours a week, the business in most cases then has to pay into um, our national health plan, the affordable care system, what people call Obamacare. And so in many cases, they want to limit their employees to under 29 hours a week. At that point, you have to do two things in order to survive. First, you have to take on two jobs or, or three jobs, as many as that, as that you can cram into to a week. And most of the people I was working with were working 60 hours a week uh, trying to earn enough money. The other thing in most cases you're forced to do, particularly if you have children, is to accept public assistance. Food stamps, we call it in the United States. Technically, it's called SNAP, uh, Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program. And basically, this is the government giving you money to help you feed yourself. While the myth in America is that most of the people who receive these benefits are, are lazy, they're, they're people who prefer not to work, who, who lay on their couches and watch uh, TV all day, the reality is, is that more than two-thirds of the people who accept food aid in America are working. In fact, our fast food industry and our retail industry, stores like, like Walmart, are dependent on this food aid so that they don't have to pay their workers a living wage. Basically, what we have is the government subsidizing, using tax money, the terrible poor wages that large corporations can get away with paying. It is a feudal system that has evolved in the United States where a very, very few make enormous, just, just unstaggering amounts of money and most people do not. For example, in the United States uh, today, eight individual people, um, and they include uh, well-known names like uh, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, eight Americans made more money than three and a half million minimum wage workers combined. The average pay for a CEO uh, at America's large corporations is $10 million a, a year. 257 times uh, his or her average worker salary. And that number, excuse me, that number has risen from 181 just five years ago to 257 times. We've reached the point in America where 1% of Americans own more than a third of our country's wealth. This is indistinguishable from what was going on in the Middle Ages where you had kings and, and, and serfs. We have lost our, our American dream 
And my book, Ghosts of Tom Joad, is about the gap between what the dream seemed to be at one time and the reality of where America is today. Wow. You know, the, the interview I, I was listening to you on, you mentioned – you mentioned that you had gone to publishing houses in New York and the people there couldn't fathom that there was people actually in desperate situations. It wasn't until later when you found someone in the Midwest that you were able to get published. And when I was listening to that, it really sounded to me like maybe the publishing firms and probably our corporate media, the big networks and so forth that put on all the news shows and tell us how rosy things are. It really reminded me of my teenage daughter's favorite movie series being the hunger games. I don't know if you've seen that. <laughs> I'm familiar with it. Yes. Okay. Well, the, in the hunger games, you have the people living in, in the capital city, which is a super technologically advanced, wealthy society in which everyone's really into like a, kind of a metrosexual um, orgy of self-indulgence. <laughs> and then there's the people in the various, you know, the other 12, these 12 districts that are kept dirt poor, and they just provide the resources for the people living this luxurious lifestyle. Really reminded me of that when you were talking about that. Absolutely. And that's where, where we are today. It, becomes increasingly difficult to get by in our, our modern America. And I, have to, I'm hasten, I hasten to add that it's, it's an evolutionary thing. Um, people here in New York, when I, when I did try to get the book published, their reaction was really that either I was making this all up, that it, it was essentially you know my version of the fictional Hunger Games, or that I was somehow exaggerating it or overstating it or being overly dramatic. And the, the thing is, is that the, the publishing industry, as well as most of the mass media in, in the United States, exists in, in a set of bubbles. Uh, most of them are based in, in New York or Los Angeles or Washington, D.C., big cities where prosperity is easy to see in the patches where people live and the hardships that many people suffer are, are off in parts of town that you really don't go to. Um, you have no need to go to the dark sides of town, the poor places. Um, and so you don't see it. You don't know it's there. The people who do this work for us, the media folks, rarely, if ever, venture into the, the middle of our country um, in fact, the, the joke in America is that they, they call it the flyover land, where you know they leave New York and they fly over and maybe look out the window and then they land in Los Angeles and, and things are, are rosy again there too. This contributes to the problems of, of trying to even alert people to what is going on, this kind of collective naivety perhaps, this collective ignorance. And when the media does kind of quietly venture out, typically around elections when candidates uh, feel it necessary to go out and shake hands of regular people um, as part of their elections, all they can do is sort of repeat the tropes. Um, people in, in, the, in the Midwest, people in the Rust Belt, people unemployed are, are either, if you're on the conservative side of politics, lazy folks who just won't get off their butts and, and go get a job and want to live off welfare and public assistance, or they're sort of uh, the rough and ready pioneers who are trying to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and they'll single out some guy who, who uh, you know started a small business and made it all happen without talking about how unique and, and, and special those tiny few cases really are. And that seems to satisfy everybody. It seems to repeat the, uh, the, the things, feedback to people what, what they want to hear. When I talk about uh, my book, um, and I've been able to do some speaking uh, about it around uh, the United States, I, I have found that I, I need two very different sort of presentations. When I'm speaking in an urban center like New York City or Boston or Washington, D.C., my discussion is more along the lines of what we're talking about, trying to educate people as to what is going on out there, pointing out some of these facts, trying to shoot down some of the myths. But when I get out of 
the, the East Coast or, or the West Coast and into the, the country, center of the country where, of course, people live this every day. They don't need me to tell them about public benefits or how to make a living, how difficult it is to make a living on minimum wage. Instead, our discussion shifts very quickly to, to why the people in, in the power structures of the United States, Washington and other, if, why they don't know this. How can we tell them how we are living? How can we convey to them that we cannot eat, that we're living in, in poverty, what, what Americans call the working poor, in the midst of a country that otherwise ranks economically as, as one of the most economically powerful nations on earth? My book was an attempt to convey to a larger audience what is going on, the truth about the two Americas that exists simultaneously, perhaps in a way to, to answer the, the, the question that your Australian researcher friend had is, how can there be such a gap between what we believe is America and what we come to find out is the reality of America? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can, I can tell you for a fact that a lot of people, uh, at least in Northern Europe, they have a rosy picture of America being like, you know, they'll watch some series like Sex in the City or <laughs> they'll see news broadcast uh, from the United States. And again, they'll they'll center on these people that, you know, someone lost their job as a lumber worker, but now they have a successful this or that microbrewery or something where the factory <laughs> used to exist. And it gives them this feeling like, oh, well, in America, things must be going really well. And. From a G, it's hard to explain to people that on a growth on a per capita income, it looks high, but the wealth distribution seems to be going more. It's like tilting a picture further and further. The sure. one one part seems to be getting lots more money, and the other part's losing it. You know, it's like if you make a million dollars and I make zero, then the average between us is is five hundred thousand dollars. And that's mathematically accurate, but in no way represents the situation where you have a million and I have have zero. Uh, you know, in the United States today, and I'm glad you mentioned about the microbreweries, there is this, again, myth that we can replace factories with microbreweries. We can replace uh, good, solid union, what once were union jobs, with boutiques and artisanal coffee shops. And this simply just ignores the, the reality. We have lost enough industrial jobs in the United States that it, it equals the number of undergraduate students in the United States. That's how many jobs we need to create, if you will, in order to start moving back towards more of a socially equitable society. We have situations now where it is harder to get a minimum wage job in some places than it is to get in, into Harvard. In Washington, D.C., Walmart opened a, a brand new store in, in a very uh, poor neighborhood, and there were so many applicants for that job that statistically it would have been easier to get into an Ivy League school than it would have been to get that job. I'll give you some other examples, and, and the numbers get kind of confusing, but, but add them all up and see where it goes. In 2014, the Ford Motor Company announced that it was going to hire 350 people in Kentucky um, after the state of Kentucky gave Ford almost $300 million in tax breaks to do this. For 350 jobs, they had 10,000 applications. <laughs> it's not that people don't want to work, it's that there are no jobs for them to work in. There are over 52,000 people unemployed in the area around that Ford plant, and at best only 350 of them are, are going to get jobs. Yeah, I was visiting my hometown of Eugene uh, okay. um, a, a few years ago, not to, about three years ago. And I noticed it was interesting that the uh, the people you would see working, like when, when I was in high school, if you wanted some money to get yourself a car or something, you worked at the summer at Taco Time or Burger King or 
sure. delivered pizza or something like that. Or if you're in college, you use that as, you know, so you don't have to take as many student loans. And when I was there last time, what was interesting was I saw a lot of warehouse type places that were closed, that had closed, mm -hmm. you know, in the few years I'd been gone. I saw a lot of guys with gray hair delivering pizzas and, yep. and Chinese food. Um, and I saw, uh, you know, like at Taco Bell, you saw mostly middle age, not old, like, well, I'm going to supplement my retirement and not young, but middle age people in their 40s and 50s uh, serving up your burrito supreme. When I went for my minimum wage uh, jobs, when I went looking for the jobs, again, I was age 52, and I'm bald with gray hair. I, I don't look a young age 52. Um, and I, on the way over there, I was sort of rehearsing all these uh, excuses and lines about why I happen to be looking for this, this, this job which in my mind I envisioned, it, as you initially described it, is you know, I was going to be somehow working alongside college students and, and things like that. So I had all these things. I even was thinking about lying about my age, and I was mentally rehearsing, you know, if, if I told them I was 40, what year was I born? You know, the kind of things that you do if you're perhaps if uh, when you were younger you were trying to get into a, a nightclub that had an age uh, limit on it. I had all this stuff in my head, and I was ready to kind of – they didn't even ask. They were, they were wholly unconcerned, and I found out soon after I started working that I wasn't even the oldest person there. There were two men uh, who were older than me doing the same kinds of jobs. One of them was using a walker and had to be assigned only to a cashier job because he basically couldn't even walk around uh, the store uh, freely uh, in order to help customers or, or, or whatever. And you see this now all over uh, America, where people who have lost their jobs in, in middle age or, or even older, or people that are retired who simply can't live on the, the, the money that they, they have or the money they get from Social Security, are forced, and I use that term carefully, are forced into working in the most basic of, of jobs, um, people who worked in their careers as accountants and computer programmers and engineers are now making our burritos and frying up our, our fast food. And, and they're the ones standing in, in Walmart uh, telling you where you can, uh, which aisle you can go to to buy paint or, or kids' toys or, or what have you. you know, that is not a situation that speaks to a nation that, that still claims it is the exceptional nation. Right. You know, I'm wondering this. And I, I was I was in a discussion with someone a couple days ago online, and I said something about the economy, and he said, "Well, it's not as bad as you think. Uh, you know, it's it's not like the United States is about ready to uh, go under." And then I asked him the question, "What would happen, do you suppose, if food stamps ended tonight? The whole program was just ended because they didn't have food stamps during the Great Depression. They had soup lines." If you cut off food stamps tonight, you know, you worked in the State Department, what would happen? Well, it, it's, it's interesting. Um, first, uh, the food stamps actually grew out of those, those uh, soup lines that you had, soup kitchens that you mentioned during the Depression. And the first food stamp programs actually began as the depression was fading in an attempt to to feed people. You know, if uh, quickly, I'll answer your point and then then offer a, a funny little, uh, funny ironic little counterpoint. You know, of course, if we cut off food stamps today, we would be facing starvation in in the United States already. Even with these food programs, and they are meager, people need to understand that the the, the money that you get is very small. As a single, uh, if I was a single man with no family and no resources, the most I would qualify for was four dollars and fifty cents a, a day in order to feed myself, and we would be facing starvation already. One out of five children in the United States is what we call food imperiled, meaning that they live right on the edge of, of proper nutrition. Um, and so to, to cut off that meager support that exists um, would, would plunge us into uh, a third world situation overnight. But the interesting thing is it's not ever going to happen because 
the organizations that are the most fervent in support of food stamps are Walmart, are McDonald's, are some of the processed food makers in the United States. And they do that for, for two reasons. The first, of course, is that food stamps act as subsidies for the pathetically low wages they're paying their workers. Walmart can't get people, couldn't get people to work for them if they had to try to get by on the $7 an hour. Walmart depends on those food stamps so that their workers can eat even though Walmart doesn't pay them. And so Walmart is one of the most uh, impressive and, and money-spending lobbyists um, for food stamps. The other side of this is that poverty is big business. Kroger, the big grocery stores in the United States all make significant amounts of money off of food stamp purchases. One of the companies that is most in favor of food stamps is uh, called Kraft Foods because many of their processed products, including uh, for those uh, who, out there who have uh, had the pleasure of dining in America, um, macaroni and cheese, a significant portion of the, of the purchases of that product are done by food stamps. The soft drink manufacturers have lobbied aggressively in Congress to have their products included on the list of things that can be bought with food stamps. In theory, food stamps can only be used for uh, healthy and nutritious foods, but in reality, the manufacturers work very hard to get their products onto the list because it's worth so much money to them. And so for all the wrong reasons, <laughs> food stamps are, are here to stay in the United States. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I just couldn't imagine what would happen if people suddenly didn't have those. I mean, no. I think it would look like some of the, I personally just think it would look like one of those situations where the lights all go off in, in, a, yes. in a major city or something overnight. Yeah. We now, call that North Korea. Yeah. The the other thing I wanted to ask is, you know, we, we seem to be getting more globalization. Um, it, it's pushed. I mean, it's like a chorus. You don't ever hear globalization really questioned in the corporate media. Well, for obvious reasons, we could go on forever about that. <laughs> but in light of these situations, if things don't change, what should people be doing today? I mean, I'm not just going to sit there and go, oh, my gosh, you know, let's just all give up. And, yeah. of course, we need to inform other people. But what are some practical steps that a college student, someone or someone going into college or even yeah. even someone who's working now can take to ensure that they don't wind up uh, in a situation where they're part of not just the 99 percent, but they're on the bottom of the 99 percent? Yeah. It's a very difficult question to, to answer. And obviously, if I had sort of, you know, top five points to do, um, I'd either be lying, writing another book, or, or maybe being a politician. Um, and, and there exists this very American way of thinking that every problem must have a solution, if we can only sort of figure out what that is. My belief, ha having studied this and, and, and lived it, is that there may not be a, a broad solution. This may be so systematic, it may be so wanted by the 1% and the politicians who feed off their money that it isn't going to change because the people who are making frightening amounts of, of money and acquiring frightening amounts of power because of it have no interest in sharing. And that's where I, I come to the, the term feudalism. Um, it, it's all appetite. Once you have... This much, you want more, and you want more until finally there's no more to take. You have it all. That's the ultimate end point. That said, there are ways to, to ameliorate this, to, to push it back a, a little, and I think the, the, the simplest and most singularly effective is that the minimum wage in the United States has to be mandated to become a living wage. Companies have to be forced, because they are not going to do it voluntarily across the board, to paying a, a living wage. They have to be told, you can't get by paying $7.25 an hour. You've got to pay more. I, I can't tell you precisely if that number should be $14 or $13.27 or, or, or whatever, but there's smart economists who can come up with that number, and we have to do that. That's 
instantly job number one. Second is our government must devote itself to the creation of jobs. There is no better way for people to better themselves, not, not only their, their physical lives, the food and things that the, and medical care that they critically need, but also their, their, their souls, their spirits, their, their, the will to do something, to get up in the morning and say, you know, I want to go out there and, and accomplish something not to fall into the cycle of, of poverty and despair. Got to create jobs. And this will require changes in the tax base, changes in how America imports and exports, all sorts of stuff that, sure, a lot of people are sort of rolling their eyes at. But you've asked me for solutions, and I'll, I'll just kind of throw them out there. Um, after that, there has to be a, 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 a move to organize workers uh, again. Individuals simply cannot make demands of their employers in, in any kind of broad sense. Sure, one guy can go ask his boss for a raise after some big deal goes through and, and those things happen. But in, in a broad sense of saying the majority of our workers need to, to have a bigger share of the pie, if you will, that can only be accomplished through organization. Uh, Ten years ago, 15 years ago, there were eight times as many union members in the United States as there are now. Unions were imperfect. There were a lot of things gone wrong, a lot of things, uh, mistakes made, and, and a lot of crimes committed uh, in their names. But at the end of the day, organized workers are the only way to push back against monolithic corporations. Those are some starting points. Um, my small contribution, if there is any at all in my book, Ghosts of Tom Joad, is to try to bring this story to more people so they understand there is a problem and perhaps start to understand what the problem is and maybe in some very, very small way set the groundwork for some of the changes that either happen in the United States or we slide further down and end up in some kind of situation where 1% of us truly control the other 99%. Okay, well, thank you. I think those are really good points you brought up there. I wish we could go on, but you indicated you have some other appointments. I'm sorry about that. I'd love to keep talking, and I hope that we can do this again. Excellent. Well, I'd encourage people out there to look up uh, – you can either find information uh, looking up Peter Van Buren on Wikipedia – or uh, you have uh, We Met Well, as well as Ghost of, of um, Ghost of Tom Joe. Tom Joe. I just uh, had a brain lapse there for a minute. Yeah, and look those look those up and, and check check the stuff that you've written and also your interviews. They're excellent, excellent uh, commentaries on both our foreign policy as well as our domestic economic policy. You're very kind, Mike. Thank you very much. Okay, and thank you, and thank you, uh, listening audience, for tuning in to this episode, or I should say this half, of uh, Unlock the Door Radio right here on UCY-TV.